The Bible nowhere says that prayer is easy because it is not a natural thing. It's a natural thing to do in an emergency, but in normal, regular life, when things are growing, going smoothly, it is an unnatural thing. It cuts against the flesh. And if you want a text to begin with tonight, and there'll be quite a few as we go through, the text is, we know not how to pray as we ought. We just don't know. We try, and we realize then how little we know. If you haven't tried, of course, you may think you can pray, but if you have, you know you can't. We need help. Now, in the days of his flesh, people could go right to Jesus and get help. They could say, Lord, teach us to pray. We need help. We can't go to Jesus now. But when Jesus left the earth, he said, it's going to be much better for you if I go away because someone else will come and take my place and he'll help you better than I can. And he sent the Holy Spirit, and one of the main functions of the Holy Spirit is to help you at the point of your greatest need, which is how to pray. We know not how to pray as we ought, but the next words in that verse are, but the Spirit helps us in our weakness. What could be more delightful? Do you realize that God is not wanting you to struggle? He's wanting to help. The Father wants to help by listening all the time. The Son wants to help by praying for you all the time and putting his signature to your petitions. And that's not where the help ends. The Holy Spirit wants to help at this end by getting the prayer going in the first place. What more help could you ask than the Holy Spirit praying in you, Jesus waiting to catch it and pass it on, and the Father waiting to receive it? A Christian has all the help he could ask for if he makes use of it. And so tonight I'm going to talk about the third person's part and how appropriate. I have kept it till tonight, as you may have realized, because it's with Sunday. I'd like to have taken it to prayer to the Father, through the Son, in the Spirit, and mentally you can slot this sermon back in there if you would. But I went on to other subjects against the devil, with the saints, by ourselves. Let's come now to back to in the Spirit. What does in the Spirit mean? It means simply I have two advocates to help me. And if you get caught up in a court case, which I hope you won't, you'll need at least one advocate, but it's better to have two. One to speak to the judge, one to speak to you, and between them to operate together. And you've got two advocates before the Father. Not just a judge, he is the judge, but he's your Father too. You have an advocate on high, you have an advocate within. Both speaking on your behalf. So that on both sides of prayer, heaven and earth, there is someone speaking on your behalf, an advocate. Again, what more could you ask for? You've got all the help you could wish. I want you to notice the prepositions I'm using. They're very important. Praying to the Father, through the Son, in the Spirit, against the devil, with the saints, by ourselves. The next subject may be for the world. I don't know. But... At the moment, it's in the Spirit. Now, how do you pray in the Spirit? Here are two more texts, Ephesians 6.18, which follows on from that uh, whole armor of God we've just had mentioned. Pray at all times in the Spirit with all prayer and supplicate. With all prayer. So it's not prayer. It's something else. With all prayer and supplication. So praying in the Spirit is a dimension added to all prayer and supplication. And you may have got no further in your prayer life than all prayer and supplication. But we're now talking about this added dimension of praying in the Spirit with all prayer. In other words, putting a new dimension to every other prayer. The little letter of Jude, which is a very intriguing, if it's a brief letter and a very relevant one to today, says pray in the Holy Spirit. Pray in. In fact, it's more important that you should pray in the Spirit than that you should pray in the bedroom or in a church or wherever else. The best place to pray is in the Spirit. And it's an immediately accessible place wherever you are, in the office, driving your car, anywhere. That is the sphere of prayer. doesn't really matter the building, but the sphere does matter, praying in the Spirit. Now, I've mentioned all the difficulties that we have in prayer, or not all of them, many of them. The difficulty of talking to someone we can't see or hear or touch the difficulty of knowing what to say when we feel we do get through, the difficulty that what we want to ask for may not be what we really need and may indeed be bad for us. We've got all these problems, the problems of wandering thoughts. You can make a long list of them. But one of the basic problems is this one of knowing what to say. 
what to say. And when the disciples said, Lord, teach us to pray, they were saying, Lord, teach us a prayer. You're listening at the back. You're listening good. Lord, teach us to pray. And they were saying, will you tell us what to say? Will you give us a form of words? Will you put the prayer together for us? Because when we get through, we really don't know what to say. We don't quite know what phrases to put together. And the Lord's Prayer was given in response to this very thing. What do we say? And in the Middle East, even when you know what to say to someone, if you want to write a letter, you have to go down a street to a little man sitting at a street corner with a pen and a brass inkstand, fascinating character, and he's got some paper, and he takes a pen, and you dictate in one ear, and he writes it down for you, the letter writer. How many of you have seen a letter writer? Or ever used one? How many of you have used one? Many? One. Well done, Andy. Sorry we didn't know you couldn't write. <laughs> well. well, now, a letter writer says, you may not be able to express yourself. You tell me what you want to say, and I'll put it down for you and send it on for you. And if I could put it this way, the Holy Spirit is the divine letter writer. He takes what we want to say and what we can't get out and what we can't put together and what we can't express and he writes it down for us and he sends it on, which is delightful to have an inbuilt letter writer all the time. Now, prayer in the Spirit has two distinct aspects and I'll try and define them for you and just speak briefly about them. There is prayer in the Spirit when he takes over your mind and gives you the right thoughts which you then have a responsibility to express. That's one kind of prayer in the Spirit. When you are praying what he has put in your mind, there is another form of prayer in the Spirit in which he does not use your mind at all, but takes over your mouth. And you have the responsibility to move your mouth and your tongue. But in this case, your cooperation is simply to use your mouth. So in the one case, it is the Spirit acting on your mind and you taking the responsibility of translating mind into mouth. In the other case, your responsibility is to forget your mind and let him have your mouth and use it. The second kind of prayer is very difficult for some people, but once they've learned it, it is a very beautiful kind of prayer. Both these kinds of prayer are praying in the Spirit. Without praying in the Spirit, prayer is simply telling God what you feel you want or what you feel is needed in the situation. It is coming from your mind and your mouth. You can then offer it through Jesus to God. But praying in the Spirit is where he has either taken your mind over and is giving you the right thoughts to express, or in fact has bypassed your mind and has taken your mouth over and in, is in fact giving you the actual words. In both cases, he does not pray for you. It says he helps us in our weakness. It doesn't say he takes over and does it for us. And this is one, one big hang-up that people have about praying in the Spirit. And it's this. One dear lady said to me, you know, she said, I've been praying for the gift of praying in another language. And she, I said, what have you been doing? She said, well, I've been kneeling by my bed. And she said, I've been asking and asking, and then I've opened my mouth like this. <laughs> and she said, I've just waited for something to come. And you know, she said, nothing has ever come. That's not surprising. Those of you who have prayed in this way will understand perfectly well why nothing ever came. The Holy Spirit does not pray for us. He helps us. And in fact, he prays with us. And we need to cooperate with him if we are going to pray in the Spirit. He doesn't pray for us, but he does pray with us. And in fact, the Greek prepositions used in Romans 8 when it says we know not how to pray as we ought, but the Spirit helps us with our infirmity. He doesn't help us out of it. He helps us in it and with it and enables us to overcome it. And that's the delightful part that he plays. Now let's take, first of all, the influence of the Spirit on the mind, what I would call mental prayer, the prayer of the mind, in which your mind is fully involved with conscious thoughts, which the Holy Spirit has placed there in some way, either through an impression, or through a burden, or through a memory, 
or through a circumstance, but the Lord himself, the Holy Spirit, has put within your mind that for which you ought to pray. Do you know when you don't know what to pray for, why don't you just ask him to tell you what to pray for? When you know someone is in need and you don't know that need, why don't you ask him to tell you what the need is? You will be astonished how often he can put the thought into your mind that is absolutely right on the button for that person. And it may not be their most obvious need either. Now, let's start with two trinities, if you like. The trinity of man, heart, mind, and will, and the trinity of God, Father, Son, and Spirit. When we are praying in the Spirit in this mental way in which thought is involved and the brain is involved, the mind is active, then first the Spirit helps us not only with the mind but with the heart and the will so that your whole personality is quickened. Very quickly, here are the three problems I have with my heart. I don't have a strong enough desire to pray. And quite simply, I do everything that I really want to do, don't you? If you really want to do a thing, you find a way to do it, right? So my first problem is with my heart, that I obviously don't want enough. Second problem, my mind, wandering thoughts, concentrating, trying to think of the right thing to pray, trying not to think about yesterday's football match. My third problem is my will, sheer discipline. Now, I can desperately try and work up a desire and feelings, and I can desperately try and keep my thoughts in the right direction. I can desperately try and discipline my will. But, you know, this desire and this direction and this determination are not easily come by, and you need a pretty strong personality to achieve them. And it is precisely at this point that the Holy Spirit says, let me help you with these three areas. Let me give you passion in your prayer. Let me give you perception in your prayer. And let me give you persistence in your prayer. Have you ever thought of asking for those three things? Lord, give me a passion to pray so that my heart wants to. Give me a perception so that my mind knows what to ask for. And give me a persistence that will keep on asking until I get it. The Holy Spirit wants to deal with the trinity of your personality and help you at each of those three points. Now let's look at what he does with the other trinity, Father, Son, and Spirit. You can always tell when someone's praying in the Spirit, even when their mind is involved and is thinking hard. You can always tell because three things will come through. Number one, the will of the Father will come through. The will of the Father. Because it says the Holy Spirit helps us in, a, in our weakness. Because he prays with us according to the will of God. And this is the vital thing, not to add a kind of codicil, a kind of cover-up clause at the end, if it be your will, but to know the will of God and to pray the will of God. And if you're praying in the Spirit, you know the will of God. Here is this sick person. If you're praying in the Spirit, you know if it's the will of God to heal that person or not. And so you can pray with the will of God into that person's life. If you're not praying in the Spirit, then you'll keep the back door open and say, if it be your will. Are you with me? And so he prays in the will of the Father. And when the Spirit is helping your thoughts in prayer, you will have the will of the Father clear in your mind. You will prove his will. It's good and acceptable and perfect. Secondly, if the Spirit is in your mental prayer, then the glory of Jesus will be in it too. Because he came to glorify me, said Jesus. He will come and glorify me. And you'll find that if someone's praying in the Spirit, their thoughts will uplift the Lord Jesus. That's another change he makes to the mental thoughts of someone praying in the Spirit. And the third thing he will do is this. And this is in connection with the Scripture. When someone is praying in the, in the Spirit, into their prayer will come not quotable quotes, but will come echoes of God's Word because the Spirit wrote the Bible and he never contradicts himself and he will pull the sword of the Spirit out of the belt of truth again and again in someone praying in the Spirit. Now you see the difference between an unbeliever praying however sincerely and someone praying in the Spirit. An unbeliever will pray for the things that they feel are needed. They will pray for what they want. They will address God. They may even say through Jesus Christ our Lord and if it be thy will. But someone praying in the Spirit, their thoughts will be clear about the will of the Father and the glory of the Son and the truth of Scripture. The Spirit will bring those three notes into prayer. I hope you're getting clearly the message that I'm trying to give you tonight. 
This is the help he wants to give you at the mental level, taking over your mind and directing your mind in prayer, giving a desire in your heart to pray, giving a perception in your mind so that you know what is the will of God, giving a determination of the will to go on asking until you get it, and leading you to uplift Jesus and draw from the truth of Scripture and seek the will of God. It just all seems to me to fit together in a pattern. But it does mean that I am responsive in my mind and open in my mind and listening with my mind to get what the Spirit is saying to me. So that the prayer becomes not my mental prayer, but his mental prayer. And I am thinking the Spirit's thoughts after him before I express them. Now that is one form of praying in the Spirit. And you will recognize it in a prayer meeting, you'll recognize it in a church, and I hope having said this, when we have the time of open prayer, you won't all be so scared that you won't pray. Nobody's going to be judging anybody else and saying, I wonder if that was prayer in the Spirit now. You know, <laughs> did they include that? Forget that in a sense. I'm speaking to you individually. I'm not giving you yardsticks by which you can judge someone else in the prayer meeting. I'm giving it to you. That's one kind of praying in the Spirit. The other kind of praying in the Spirit is unknown to many Christians today, but is known to an increasing number. In this kind of prayer, as Paul says, the mind is unfruitful or quite literally unproductive. In other words, in this kind of prayer in the Spirit, there are no thoughts at all. And in fact, the Holy Spirit takes over at another level. He takes over a bit lower down than the mind. He takes over at the mouth level. And he prays and offers to God a prayer that is beautiful, that is a prayer that you have not had to think up. And I just tell you, it's a sheer relief sometimes to, to be able to pray a prayer that you've not had to think up or that you've not had to wrestle through with the Spirit to get in terms of thought from him, especially when you're tired, when you find it difficult to pull your thoughts together. It's a form of prayer that comes in very useful when you're busy doing other things and need your mental concentration elsewhere. For example, the kind of prayer I've been talking about thus far would be very dangerous to exercise while you're driving. It really would. Because your mind would be concentrating on the traffic. It ought to be. You need five eyes at once in Guildford traffic. And if you're praying mental prayer while you drive and you're trying to get his thoughts into your mind while you drive, you are a dangerous driver. As dangerous as if you were filled with another kind of spirit. <laughs> but you can pray the prayer in the spirit that is mouth only and lose no mental concentration whatsoever and pray while you drive, perfectly safely. Or while you do the washing up. Or while you're doing another job. Or when you just don't know what to pray. Or when you're stuck for words completely. Now I think it's most lovely and gracious of God ever to think of giving us such a help in prayer, don't you? I think that's beautiful. Let me tell you a little more. What does it sound like? A prayer that has not come from someone's mind. Well, let's start very simple. It may sound to you like a groan. Like a groan. Some prayer in the Spirit. Romans 8, my text, we know not how to pray as we ought. But the Spirit helps us in our weakness. How? What form of prayer? What comes out? With groans that cannot be uttered. Now, the word uttered doesn't mean noised. It doesn't mean sounded. The word uttered means to put something into words. That's the Greek word. On the day of Pentecost, they were all filled with the Holy Spirit, and they began to speak as the Holy Spirit gave them utterance. And the word means form of words. It doesn't mean that the Holy Spirit made their voice box go. That is their responsibility. It means the Holy Spirit shaped their tongue and mouth to turn the sound into words. And indeed, that is one of the secrets of this kind of prayer, that you make the noise and the Holy Spirit shapes it. But he says, groans that cannot be uttered. And sometimes the Holy Spirit enables you to pray with a groan that can't be put into words at all. Neither the, your own language nor any other, but just a sheer groan. And it's a prayer. I wonder if you've ever prayed that kind of prayer. 
and just groaned. But it's a prayer and it's a strong prayer. And you look through the Bible to see how often the Lord hears the people groaning. I don't know if you've been in an earthquake. But if you have, you've heard the earth groaning. The rocks groan. And you know, towards the end of history, there are going to be more and more earthquakes. And Romans 8, the same chapter in the same context of our groans that cannot be put into words, says the whole creation is groaning. The whole creation is groaning. There are groans coming up from nature itself, waiting for God to redeem the whole of nature, including our bodies and the new heaven and the new earth. We're, we're thinking big at the moment. I don't know if you have got that big in your thinking yet. But the whole of creation groans, and you can groan with it. And sometimes your, your longings are so deep, your, your burdens are so deep, your passions are so deep, you can't put it into words. Even the Spirit can't put it into words for you, so he enables you to groan. Oh, and it's a prayer. Another form of prayer in the scripture that is from the mouth, that doesn't come from the mind, is a sigh, a sigh. Have you ever noticed a sigh in scripture and how God listens to sighing? Have you ever sighed? <sighs> that can be prayer. Isn't our concept of prayer narrow when we limit it to verbal communication? Haven't we got altogether too small a view of prayer? Shall I tell you another form of prayer when you can't get it into words and the Holy Spirit doesn't put it into words? Tears. Tears. When you can do nothing but weep. Have you prayed in that way before? No words, just tears. And you know, in the Middle East, when someone is bereaved, relatives who have wept in, for them in their sorrow have little glass bottles like this, and they hold them here, and they catch the tears, and instead of sending a wreath to the funeral, they send a bottle of tears. I think that's more meaningful than a wreath. And the psalmist says, Put my tears in your bottle, O Lord. That's prayer. And God has a bottle to catch a tear. Prayer, do you remember the hymn, what is it? The upward glancing of an eye when none but God is near. A sigh, a tear. Do you remember that? can't just quite get the verse. You've got it, Molly, but I can't just quite get it. Um, but it mentions a sigh, a tear. Sigh. Got it? Right, it's in your hymn book. Right, not just in the Bible. <laughs> but accept it on the authority of the Bible, not the Baptist hymn book, won't you? <laughs> Nevertheless, are you getting the message? The Holy Spirit can lead to many forms of prayer which are not even uttered, which are never put into words. A groan, a tear, a sigh are not put into words. And then there are other kinds of prayer in which your mind is not involved, but in which ejaculations do occur in a word or a phrase. Let's think of some of them. Abba is one. Have you ever found yourself shouting that? Not daddy, that's the English translation. Have you ever heard yourself saying Abba? Well, do you know, it says that if you do, the Spirit is bearing witness with your spirit that you're the Son of God. Why? Because it is the Spirit of the Son of God in you using your mouth to address his own Father in his favorite way in the Aramaic language. Abba. And that's why it's kept in the original Aramaic in every English translation. It's not when you cry, Daddy, it's when you cry, Abba, which is Jesus calling to his own Father through your mouth. And my, you know you're a child of God when you cry, Abba. And it says, when you shout out, Abba, the verb is to cry out. It's the verb used when the disciples saw Jesus walking on the water and they were scared stiff and they shouted out. The Greek verb is kradzine. They kradzined. And it says, when you kradzine, Abba, it's the spirit of his son. Galatians 4 says it again. The spirit of his son within you is calling to his own dad through your mouth in his original language. Abba. Here's another. Maranatha. Maranatha. Do you know what that means? It means, come, come, Lord Jesus, come back, come quickly, come, Maranatha. 
You ever said that in your prayers? Without thinking about it? Spirit of his son was doing it if you did. But now let's come to the heart of it. The Holy Spirit can not only make you groan and express your deepest longings that way, or in a sigh, or in tears, or in an ejaculation that may well be in the original language of Jesus, he can also give you total fluency in any language he knows. Do you know, if there's one word I hate, and I wish I could expunge from every translation of the Bible, it is the word tongues. It, it conveys to me a kind of babbling hysteria, which is so far from the truth that I'm not surprised it puts people off. Why will the translators not use the proper word? I'll tell you why, because they have no idea what, it, what the experience is, and they're just guessing. That's why. And so they don't translate it as they ought. And the translation in English of the Greek word is language. And what's wrong with language? Nothing at all. So wherever you see the word tongues, cross it out and put in the word languages in your home and dry. And on the day of Pentecost, they were all with one accord in one place. And they were all filled with Holy Spirit. And they all began to speak in other languages as the Spirit put the words together. Now that's what was happening. And do you know the devil hates this because he knows it sets people free in prayer, and he hates it. And he hates it because he knows every word of that prayer will be just right. And that's why he will do anything he can to turn people off this, to make people fanatical in it so others will be put off, to get you away from that and say you don't need it, and in any way it's only for some, so don't you bother about it and don't you want it. I stand firmly with the Apostle Paul tonight. I would that you all spoke in tongues. I would that you all did. Especially those of you who have greater mental powers than others. I wish you could understand the simplicity of giving him your mouth and letting him pray through you and being released. In much the same way as the simple testimony we had earlier. Sometimes quite unexpected. The Lord just releasing you to give him a prayer in which he has supplied every word for you. You know, when your children are small and it's your birthday, did you give your children money to go and get a present for you? Did you do that? Well, we did. Most parents do. God says, here's a prayer to pray to me. It's only those who are prepared to become as little children and even learn baby talk who will receive such a gift. But it's a beautiful gift. If anybody decries that gift, I remind them it was the first one the Lord gave to his church. The very first. If you say it's the lowest, then I say that's the best one to begin with, for starters. But it was a lovely gift. You know, they'd been meeting in a prayer meeting. They'd had a daily prayer meeting. That was a church of prayer. Believe me, 120 people met every day for prayer in that church. And they'd met every day for 10 days in prayer, and they'd had mental prayer. But on the first Whit Sunday, they switched from mental prayer to a completely different kind of prayer in which God had their mouths but not their minds. And he poured out his spirit on all flesh, and they were free, and they were praising him. And this gift is given not to talk to others. That's why I have serious queries about a translation that is addressed to men. I think the tongues have stimulated a prophecy in that case. The translations that convince me are the ones that are addressed to God because this is addressed to God, not to men. And secondly, it is a gift primarily for private prayer. And while I have stood firmly with the Apostle Paul in saying, I would that you all spoke in tongues, I really wish you'd, you would come to me and say, do you know what happened this week to me? I really wish you could. But I stand firmly with the Apostle Paul also in this, by conviction, I would rather speak five words to you in church that you understand than 10,000 in another language. And that's where I stand, firmly on the scripture. And I stand with St. Paul. And that, I believe, is where the primary use of the gift is to help me when I'm stuck to be released. Oh, there are abuses and there can be counterfeit. I came across one in New Zealand where somebody in public showed off this gift which they thought they had and it proved to be of Satan because it was in the Maori language. 
and the Maoris present recognized it and it was blasphemous and obscene. This counterfeit. But you know, the devil only counterfeits where the real thing is around. He doesn't bother to counterfeit what nobody has that's real. And yes, there are strict scriptural limitations on this gift in public because if I pray in another language right now, it's going to help nobody but me. It will build me up. It will release me. It won't help you one little bit unless somebody translates it for you. And that's such a roundabout way of praying that it's best to limit it to two or three at the very most in one meeting. There are scriptural limits on the public use of this gift. But I'm talking to you about prayer these Sunday evenings and I want to help you in your private prayer as well as public. And this is a supreme gift. Do you know, I've read many, many books on the life of St. Paul. I've even read books which contained a chapter on the prayer life of St. Paul and he had a tremendous prayer life. And they've put together from his epistles all the mental thoughts he had on prayer. The things he prayed that they may be filled with the fullness of God, that they may prove the length and breadth and height of love. But you know, in not one book I have read on St. Paul have I ever heard mentioned this particular form of prayer. And yet the astonishing thing is that he says in one of his letters to the Corinthian church, which was Pentecostal, capital P, capital E, capital N, capital T, with all the trimmings and with all the abuses. And he said to them, I thank God I speak in languages more than all of you. And there you hit the secret of Paul's power. How could a man who was stoned, shipwrecked, beaten, given 39 stripes on more than one occasion, how did he keep it up? How did he manage? How did he support himself? How did he keep going? Paul says, I thank God I have a way of praying. And I use it more than all the Corinthians put together. And you've touched one of the deep secrets of his life. When Paul was beaten, tired, he knew that he could pray without mental effort and that God could just take over. <coughs> I'm spending a bit more time on this because the first part of my talk tonight you are more familiar with and you can read in other books. The second part you're not familiar with. I'm going to ask how many of you have been given such a gift of prayer without your mind. Just slip your hands up and slip them down. Down again. Isn't that lovely? I'm not going to ask anyone else to put their hand up. I'm going to ask you to just ask yourself, would I like such a gift? I praise God that so many of you have found release in this way. I'm going to tell you two stories which I may have told you before. I'm always repeating myself, but Jesus did too. First is a lovely story of Ralph Wilkerson, not Dave Wilkerson, of the, so the cross and the switchblade, sorry. But Ralph Wilkerson, who's no relation, but who is in Los Angeles, and some of you have been in that vast round church outside Disneyland, of which he's the pastor. Uh, it was built as a theater, but the Lord had better plans for it, and it's now a center of prayer and power. And um, it's called Melodyland. That's a good name for a church, isn't it? That's right out of the old tradition. Well, now, Ralph Wilkerson told us this story while he was here at Guildford University. He told us about a Methodist minister who came to him and said, Ralph, he said, I now know there's a dimension of prayer that I've known nothing about, and I want you to pray that I may have this ability to praise God in a language not my own. And so Ralph laid hands on him and prayed for him. And he opened his mouth and he said, Abby Dabby, Abby Dabby, and nothing more. So he opened his mouth again and he said, Abby Dabby, Abby Dabby, and nothing more. And he got up from his knees with a shining face. He said, Ralph, he's done it. He's done it. And Ralph said, well, praise the Lord. <laughs> and from then on, this minister got nothing more than the, those few words, Abby Dabby, Abby Dabby. And I'm afraid he, he used them in public too. So he got a nickname. Guess what it was? <laughs> here, go, here comes old Abby Dabby down the road, you see. And he got landed with this label, Abby Dabby. And you know, Ralph just did not believe that this was the real thing. He couldn't. So he prayed earnestly for this minister. And he said, Lord, will you please give him a real fluency? Will you give him a real language? <laughs> Quickly. <laughs> if he goes on like this, you know, it puts so many people off. The day came when the ministers in that area of Anaheim 
uh, where Disneyland is, had a minister's return, and they said to Ralph Wilkerson, look, Ralph, will you come and preach, uh, will you come and speak to us, rather, at our next fraternal about this thing called tongues? It's appearing all over the place, and we're having trouble in the church, and we're getting divided. Will you come and talk to us about it? We don't know anything about it. So Ralph said, right, I'll come. As soon as he said yes, the Methodist minister rang him up and said, Ralph, great, you're talking to the ministers about this. I must be there. And Ralph thought, oh, no. <laughs> Well, now he said, look, if you are there, he said, look, they've asked me to speak, remember, not you. So leave it to me, please, and, and you just pray for me that I may be given wisdom to put it aright and so on. So the fraternal came, and dear Ralph spoke, and he tried to keep this whole meeting in his own hands, and he tried to keep speaking right to the end of it because he could see this Methodist minister, you know, <laughs> jumping up and down on his seat a bit, and he thought, no, I must keep going and keep him sound. Well, he finally finished. Up gets this Methodist minister and says, brethren, everything you've heard is true. I know it in my own experience. In fact, he said, the Lord is leading me to exercise the gift right now. Abby dabby, abby dabby. <laughs> and Ralph was sort of crawling under the table <laughs> and he thought, that's finished. That He couldn't get out quick enough and he, he just almost ran home. He thought, well, those ministers will never ask again. The next morning, two Episcopalian ministers came to Ralph's house and they said, Ralph, will you pray for us? Oh, why? We want a new dimension to our prayer life, too. Ralph said, you, you still want that after yesterday's meeting, after that Methodist minister, in spite of all that he did? Yes, said the two Episcopalians. It wasn't what you said, it was what he did. Ralph said, what he did? Not what I said, no. How come? Well, they said, we know that man... First, we know he's got a brilliant intellect. He's got degrees, string of degrees after his name. And he said a man with an intellect of, of that capacity could make up something better than Abby Dabby, Abby Dabby. He was willing to appear a fool. And second, since he first said those words, his ministry has been transformed. So we want it. That's not the end of the story. A year or two later, Ralph Wilkerson went on an African tour. And in the heart of Africa, in the middle of a village, he was walking through among the Africans, and somebody right behind him said, Abby Dabby, Abby Dabby. <laughs> and he thought, that Methodist minister in Africa. <laughs> and he turned around. And he turned around. He was looking into the face of an old African man. And he was struck with shame and he had to go back to Los Angeles and go straight to that minister and say I confess I've never believed that God gave you a tongue he said I now know he gave you a simple babyish one or what sounded babyish so that your great intellect could be humbled and I'm sorry that's one story the other story I've shared with many of you in membership training classes, and I think a personal testimony would not be out of place at this point. Many years ago now, I was in a church where there was a deacon who was again the government. The Lord seems to put one, <laughs> usually. <laughs> Thin ice, beware. And this uh, dear deacon, you know, after church meetings, my wife would say to me, sympathizing with me, wish the Lord would deal with that man. I can see how hard it is on you. And he didn't like me, and that was mutual. And we didn't get on. He had a great brain. He built up a big business. But, you know, every year I got a respite from him because every year he went ill about May he had a, a hay fever condition coupled with an asthmatic chest. And every May or June, he would go down, be flat on his back for six weeks. And we got respite. It was uh, rather pleasant, to, you know. I must admit my motives were mixed. And one year came, many years ago, and he was flat on his back. And I was having peace. So was he, I think. And, you know, he asked me to go and visit him, and I went on a Sunday afternoon, and all the way there, partly perhaps because his name was James, I kept thinking of James 5, James 5, and I thought, well, now what is James 5 about? 
If is any among you sick, let him send for the elders, let them anoint him with oil, let them pray. I thought, well, could I do it for him? Well, I hadn't done it before for one thing. Do you know, when I got to his house and talked to me, looked me straight in the eye, and he said, what do you think about James 5? And he said it in a very aggressive tone. And I said, well, I have been thinking about it. What do you think about it? He said, would you do it? He said, I've got to be in Switzerland on Thursday. It's urgent for my business. I've got my air ticket. He said, the doctor's put me to bed, flat my back for two weeks. I've just got to go. Would you consider doing it? I said, well, I'll consider it. I'll think it over. You think it over and get your wife to ring me Wednesday morning. And his wife rang on Wednesday morning and said, uh, he wants you to come and do it. So I said, well, I feel I ought to. So I rang up a few of the other deacons and I said, would you mind fasting and praying today and coming with me tonight? And I went to Boots and bought a little bottle of olive oil and felt a bit of a fool doing so. And, and then I went alone into the church, the church building to pray. And I went into the pulpit where I usually stood and I knelt to pray. Do you know I couldn't pray for that man? Well, could you in those circumstances? I didn't like him. I didn't want him back. <laughs> I didn't want him healthy. And I, you know, it was my mental prayer. And the Lord couldn't even give me the right thoughts about him. And then, I don't know quite how it happened. I had no emotions, whatever. No feelings, no hysteria, whatever. I suddenly began praying for that man as I've never prayed for anyone else in my life. And I prayed and I prayed and I prayed. And it was all absolutely real. I knew I was praying exactly what God wanted from me. The only thing is I was praying in what I assume now from what I've heard since was Chinese, which is certainly a language I've never learned or mastered, nor ever will. But then God isn't English, is he? He knows every language in the world and the languages of the angels as well. I don't know how many that, that is. There are languages of men and of angels. Of course, without love, none of them are any use at all. That's why you don't use them unless they're translated, because you don't love someone if they don't understand what you're saying. But anyway, I don't know what language it was, probably Chinese. And I remember looking at this watch and saying, my, that's an hour fast. But an hour had gone like that. Still had no feeling, no hysteria, but I was praying. I was praying. So I thought, well, I've got another half hour. I'm going to go on praying. So I'll go on praying, and sure enough, the language just flowed back, and I was able to pray for him. And you know, it was beautifully restful, because my mind was just at peace and at rest. So we went to see him that night, and we laid hands on him, we poured oil over his head. He lay there, gray and ill. We confessed our sins, and that was pretty good to get that out. But do you know what happened when we'd finished? Absolutely nothing. Nothing. And he lay there, he couldn't even sit up. And here was my first big test. And I got up and I remember looking at him and saying, Well, Jimmy, we've done everything we could. We've done everything the Bible says. Have you still got your air ticket for tomorrow? He said, Yes. Right, I said, I'll run you to the airport. And I went home. And I tell you, I didn't sleep a wink. <laughs> and I can tell you that in the morning, I hadn't the guts to ring him up. And I tried to get on with preparing a sermon and couldn't concentrate and thought, no, I, I wonder what it <laughs> I just couldn't concentrate. The telephone rang, and when I picked it up, a voice said, will you run me to the airport? I said, are you all right, Jimmy? <laughs> he said, I'm fine. I said, have you been to the doctor? He said, yes, the doctor says I can go. He said, I've even been had my hair cut. And the barber said, excuse me, sir, but I think I ought to tell you, your hair is getting rather greasy. <laughs> and... Uh, <laughs> So I said, would you like a shampoo as well? <laughs> so he was just able to tell him and share the story with him. Now I tell you, I tell you two very simple and beautiful things. Number one, he has never been troubled with that again. He's been in Melmede, he may be here tonight for all I know. And number two, and to me far more wonderful, we were the closest friends. And when the Lord told me that I had to come to Guildford, and I was really being torn and feeling my roots being pulled up, the first man I made for to share it with was that man. And I honestly 
believe that it's true, that he would rather have the sickness again and remain friends with me than lose the friendship and be healthy. He's got it in perspective. And it was that night that I discovered that there is a prayer in the Spirit that God wants to help us with. And if somebody says, must I pray this way? My answer is, you've got the question wrong. Shouldn't you be saying, may I? May I? Because the Holy Spirit, being a gentleman, never forces you to do anything you don't want to do. He's a gentleman. I love it when somebody says, may I? But if someone says, must I do this? The answer is, of course you mustn't. But if you say, may you? I would be very disappointed in a God who didn't give that gift to someone who really wanted it. Very disappointed. I haven't had many grounds for disappointment in my God. My disappointment is that people run a thousand miles from something that is unknown or peculiar or something that they just don't understand even though everything that is sent down from heaven is perfect and good. And this is a thing sent down from heaven. So don't let the devil tell you it's anything else. It is satanic work to try and stop you praying as God wants you to pray. And he will tell you all kinds of funny tales to get you off this one. So let me finish by being very practical. How? I can tell you in two words. And I'm now talking about both forms of praying in the Spirit, the form that involves your mind and the form that doesn't. And if you want my scriptural authority for those two distinctions, there it is in 1 Corinthians 14, Paul says, I pray with my mind and I pray with the Spirit. I sing with my mind and I sing with the Spirit. These are two different kinds of singing, two different kinds of prayer. And Paul says, I'm going to do both. Beware those who only pray in tongues and never pray with the mind. Beware those who only pray with the mind, never pray in the spirit, or with the spirit, as it would be put, small s. Well then how? Here are the two words. Ask, receive. I can't put it any simpler. Everybody who is helped in prayer has first asked. And look, here's a text from Luke 11 which cannot apply to unbelievers, because unbelievers cannot even know the Holy Spirit. It can only, therefore, apply to believers, and it tells them to ask for Holy Spirit. And the theologians come along and say, but you're a Christian, you already have the Holy Spirit. Yes, you have the Holy Spirit, the person, but you can always ask for more, can't you? And this text says, if you who are evil know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Heavenly Father give Holy Spirit to those who go on asking him? That's number one. Do you want to be helped in this area? Do you want this? Then ask until you get it. Like that friend at midnight, go on hammering on the door until you get it. God loves to answer bold importunity. But there's another side, and this is where the hang-up so often occurs. In a sense, there is a surrender involved, an active surrender of letting go and letting God. The one thing most of us hate to do is to let go of our self-control. Because we fear that if we let go of our self-control, we finish in chaos or even madness. I tell you, the fruit of the Spirit is self-control. Let go your own self-control and you get his self-control, which, believe me, is much better than yours. And a genuine gift of the Spirit has no loss of self-control about it whatsoever. If it has, it's not of the Spirit. And hysteria is not of the spirit. The spirit of the prophet is subject to the prophet, says Paul. Not to the spirit, but to the prophet. And therefore the Holy Spirit graciously is subject to your control. That's the incredible thing. So that no one need ever be afraid of being rushed beyond their control. You decide whether you let him take over or not. And if you don't like what he does when he takes over, you can stop it. But you won't want to. So we come down to how do you receive? Well now, if I had a bar of chocolate here and I held it out, you would know how to receive that, wouldn't you? I would say, here it is. Ask for it, now receive it. You'd know that you'd have to come out and take it. I once was talking to children in a church and I was trying to describe what grace was and I had a bar of chocolate and I said, here it is. For the first child that comes out and gets it. And you know, nobody moved. All the people watched. 
until one very cheeky little lad ran out and he grabbed it and he ran back. Now, he actually did something that received what was being offered, do you see? Now, I think the biggest hang-up with many people is that they ask, 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 and never receive. And receiving involves an active grasping of something. It involves getting over the psychological hurdle, for example, of hearing your own voice make sounds that you don't understand. That's a real hurdle, and you've just got to do it till you get over it. If that is your hang-up, some people gloriously don't have that hang-up, and they can just open their mouth and start. But others have to get over that hang-up. And they have to go on talking until the Lord has got them over the psychological hurdle and then gives them a language and gives them fluency. And they may feel it's baby talk at first because they've never heard such things from their own mouth. But as they go on, as they go on, they know it's a language, it's got grammar, syntax, and it's a language of heaven. It's a language that God is giving to address to himself. It's a bit like Peter in the boat, and Jesus said, or Peter said to Jesus, could I walk in the water? And Jesus didn't say, well now get your Bible out, claim the promises, get on your knees in that boat, pray, 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 pray. No, Jesus said, come on, do it. He was always doing that to a man lying on his stretcher. He said, get up and carry that thing. He didn't say, get out your Bible, read this promise, pray, 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 pray. He said, do it, do it. And you know, that's how spiritual gifts come. You don't know if you've got a gift of healing until you go and lay hands on someone. You won't know. I just say when your spirit receives a strong impression that you could do something, why not just step out of the boat and do it? That's how such gifts come. That's how you receive. If I can put it like this, the Bible doesn't say a gift of the Spirit is brilliant piano playing, but supposing it did, and supposing it lists among the gifts of the Spirit a word of knowledge, a word of wisdom, a brilliant gift of piano playing, um, and so on. Sorry, no <laughs> reference intended to any known living person. But <laughs> supposing it was a gift just like that, how would you know if you'd received it? There is only one way I know, and that is for you to go to a piano and sit down and put your fingers on the keys, right? and start. You'd soon find out whether you'd received a gift or not. <laughs> May I tell you about Muriel Shepherd, now the conductor of the London Emmanuel Choir, since her late husband conducted that choir? Do you know that both Edwin and Muriel one night just asked the Lord to drench them in his spirit and fill them with his spirit? And do you know that up to that point Muriel could not play one note on the piano without music, not one note? Some musicians can do both, but most are either ear or eye. And she was eye. And disasters had occurred when she'd mislaid a piece of music or left it at home and she arrived at a concert. Disaster. Somebody had to step in. So after she was drenched in the spirit, she said, Lord, would you give me a gift of playing the piano by ear? And in the middle of the night, the Lord said, I've given you the gift. And in the middle of the night, she went downstairs and she sat at the piano and she put no music in front of her and she played. And she's played without music ever since. Now, how did she know she had the gift? From some promise of the Bible? From some message from heaven? No. She knew it when she went downstairs to the lounge and put her fingers on the keys. That's how you discover every other gift. And in particular, this is how you pray in the Spirit. You ask, Lord, I'm weak. I need your help. I need your Holy Spirit. I cannot pray as I ought. Then receive and say, Lord, I believe that as I pray, if this is a mental prayer, that you will put the right thoughts in my mind that will glorify the Lord Jesus, me in the center of his will, and draw on the truth of Scripture. Fine, but I beg you, don't stop there. There is another kind of prayer. And you can ask, Lord, I'm tired tonight. My mind can't put the thing together. Lord, here's my mouth. And I'm just going to start talking. And you give the utterance. And it'll still be prayer. Or oh, Lord, it may even be, Holy Spirit, that you can't put it into words for me. Just help me to cry. Or to sigh. 
or to groan. But Holy Spirit, help me to pray. Let us pray. Holy Spirit of God, we can talk to you as well as in you. And we thank you that you're still around and that Pentecost is today, not yesterday or 2,000 years ago. And Lord, I pray that my words may be used to remove barriers of suspicion or prejudice and just open up many hearts and minds and wills to your help in prayer. Holy Spirit, thank you that you want to do this for us. Release us, we pray. And Lord, I have a sense in my heart that some listening to me tonight will go home tonight and before they go to sleep tonight will have prayed to you in a new way, a way they've never prayed before. Oh, thank you for those holy private moments when you not only listen, but you do the speaking too. And spirit communes with spirit and deep calls to deep. Oh, thank you in the name of Jesus. Amen.